Okay, we are here for part two of Dave Fremantle's uh, interview uh, on Intake 147. Um, and before I begin, I want to just um, uh, mention uh, uh, Tony Ballinger has been quite active behind the scenes, um, helping to recruit um, people to be interviewed. And uh, in fact, he is responsible for this interview that I'm doing now, that for setting it up and introducing David and I to each other. So Tony, thank you so much. Keep up the keep up the good work, my brother. And thanks to all of you who come forward with suggestions of people that we can interview. Um, and, and I will be following up on all those suggestions uh, in due course. Um, Hannes has been absent a little bit uh, this month because he's been away in Zim. He came back and now he's gone back to Bulawayo for Bloodnuts Memorial, who was uh, tragically murdered uh, the other the other, the other night uh, in Bulawayo. Um, but Hannes will be back on Saturday. So um, he he promises that he will be he will be active again soon. Um, and I will be leaving for the Philippines in two weeks' time. But without further ado, uh, let's get back to the subject of um, mm -hmm. Intake 147 and some of the characters who were in that intake. Um, so I'm going to hand over to David now. Dave, it's, it's over to you, my brother. No, thank you very much for this, because uh, it's a great honor to actually be able to do this, and um, I'd like to thank the great many people who actually put a, a lot of hard work into um, into the book and in um, their contribution i wouldn't have been able to put this together without their contribution and um it's their story and it's a it's it's a hard one really but there's a lot of sad stuff and a lot of a lot of really really funny stuff that a lot of and um uh paul allen's been very very helpful in uh, putting this together because when you look at it uh, we there was uh, it's basically three books put in two books put into one um but the the addition of, of five in-depth story has been of great importance because they did they were extremely active as well and they were in the thick of it well before we were and when we lost our first uh, casualty with five in-depth it did put a big uh, dam on our own morale because suddenly we were realized you know we were only young kids and suddenly I think it's a part in the book there were Otto Quick says you know he was brought up as a um, very strong religious background and he said the first time they ever put live ammunition in his hands he said he went cold and he said he thought looked at this and said you know I've got to kill people how the hell am I going to do this sort of thing so it, it, it's when you look at this, the the the, uh, the the frightening statistics of what was going on, and we didn't know what was happening really politically, and we were in the middle of something much bigger than we were, but we did it, and um, we continued to do it. And at one stage, when the um, Geneva Convention was going. And uh, we were based at Ruda, based at Ruda BC camp in the Hondi Valley there. And um, we were told, the officers that were actually told to take the platoons out and to, and to sort of find somebody who was uh, reliable enough to sort of uh, oversee it. They were, we were upset because we were being told, you know, things weren't going to be going the way we wanted to. But we had to continue and we did we did our duty but it's uh, so from that, from that perspective there they were really worried and i think they were rightly worried too however we were 21 months doing our national service which was quite long it got extended twice extra six months and then you know when that came around you know, it was quite horrific and 146 had a i think they call themselves their book they called the forever boys you can understand why because they were only eight weeks in front of us so when theirs was extended uh, 
it was more of a shock to them because they were literally days out. But we, we had a couple of months basically to adapt. Um, so for, I guess for them, it must, it must have hurt them pretty much too. But when I think of the, uh, the guys that, that, that I worked with there, hell, it was incredible what we did. Uh, the camaraderie, the, um, the close-knitness, you know, the way in which everybody still comes together now is quite, quite phenomenal. And we've had several um, reunions in South Africa, and I still remember the one there where um, Jimmy Jamison was there, um, Errol Mann, who passed away just in, uh, this, in December, sadly, um, and uh, Major, Major Kutzer was there, and they all spoke. And uh, to see how strong they still were and how committed they were, and to see how many of the guys that actually turned up was really great to be able to travel all the way there and, 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 and see that. Um, it's been quite a journey for us all, really. Um, we had people like, uh, quite, quite well, famous people like uh, Bruce Robler, for example. He's made a, a name for himself in, in soccer and what have you. Um, I think he, he's uh, had, had a book also uh, done on his own little, his, his, his life. He was at five end depth. Neil Jackson's another, another one. I wish I'd actually known him a lot better. Uh, somebody who knows him a lot better is, uh, is Signalum, Mark Ray. Now, he, he, he gave me, there was one story where they were um, across in Mozambique and uh, they got stomped there and they had to, re, they had to do a, a quick, fast retreat back. And uh, Dan Jackson, was, uh, all he could see was his long legs hurtling towards the borderline and uh, bailing over. And as they, as they managed to jump the fence, Neil Jackson was standing there with the armored cars and they put a few rounds into the building where the Turks were hiding out, and quickly silenced them. So that's another story that's in the book, which is uh, better told by, uh, you've got to actually understand and read part of um, the way in which uh, Mark writes his stories and that. Another was at the, uh, the gun, uh, business center where we lost quite a few. Now, um, Neil Jackson was the KCAR commander at, um, at this particular thing, where three tours were killed. I think, you know, there was uh, four RR at this OP had spotted six tours being fed there, and um, they, were, they were called in. And whilst they were bringing them in, it was like on a typical hillside in, in the Eastern Highlands. And uh, when fire force was activated and the trip water helicopters, they were able to take advantage of a deep wooded gully that ran south from the business center that allowed them to approach and more of our trips to the OP were unaware of the approaching fire force. So when they came in, they, were, they, were, they, they didn't know that they were coming in. And the three tours were actually killed by KCON, on the initial firefight. Um, despite it coming under heavy fire, uh, three other, the other three ran for cover in a line of wattle trees. Uh, one was killed before reaching the trees, the second reached the trees, the third attempted to reach shelter in the brick house, but he was flushed out by a burst of 20 mil cannon from the Keiko, and he collapsed from his injuries and was later captured. Um, three stop groups had been dropped each side of the business centre, and they were joined by troops from 4R, and the two G-cars returned to Chapinga to fetch the second wave which, uh, uh, five, of five in-depth troops to come in. And the lone surviving terrorist climbed into a mango tree, High up. Now, as you know, you get sort of, um, uh, we were looking, they were looking down, not up. But this guy, he, he lodged himself up in, high up in this mango tree. And he took three guys out uh, from this mango tree as they were trying to get through the fence. The bush, which was flanked with open cultivation, he remained on a covered swept and a sweep required to try to locate his position so they couldn't actually see him. They didn't, couldn't see him. And uh, the um, subgroups withdrew to allow the lynx to strike the area with brownies and snap rockets whilst the take off fired 20 mil and HG rounds in the area, but they thought he was to be hiding. They still didn't dislodge him. 
and uh, the land survivors uh, fled into an area of dense bush, which was flanked by up here, and he remained there. Now, whilst the second sweep was coming in, um, climbing through the fence was accurate fire and dense killed Mark Torrington, hell of a nice bloke, and John Crew. And Jimmy Davis was wounded. It, the, um, it, uh, he had the LMG gun and it hit the, it's actually blinded him. Um, so we had those three there, but, the, but he, there were others that had been wounded. And it was uh, Carlos, there was Jimmy Davis, Carlos Mayer, and Lance Corporal Smith Rainsford were injured as well. So that's, so you got two dead and three wounded for one guy. It's, it's a lot. When this happened, we were shocked. But when they finally dislodged him, then they caught him. He was still alive. But he'd run out of ammunition. Now, God knows what it would have happened if he hadn't run out, run out of ammunition. He, had, he was missing a leg. Um, this is the tenacity of, of what we were up against. <coughs> yeah. Had, um, it reminds me um, of um, that story that Nigel Henson told us, where he and um, uh, he and Russell Phillips were uh, went to um, rest under a tree, and um, and and there was a whole bunch of them hi hiding up in this tree, and only when only when they lay down under the tree, Russell Phillips saw them, and. Uh, said uh watch out sir and he opened fire up into the tree and these guys started falling out of the tree like ripe fruit you know <laughs> and uh yeah so you know i mean you, you're not you're not you're not thinking about the trees you're thinking about the grass and the and the bushes um i mean you know i think in our training you know like when we did a drake shoot for example in training uh where you presented with an empty field and then you have to uh, look for likely hiding places and and fire two rounds into each what you think is a likely hiding place. And then afterwards you go and inspect uh, to see how many targets you put a bullet through uh, to help to teach you to look through cover and concealment uh, or try and look through concealment to to locate the enemy. And then when we did jungle lane, the same. Um, you generally speaking. You know, you're walking down a, a, a jungle lane and there's there's targets hidden and sometimes targets pop up around you. But as far as I can remember, nothing hidden in the trees, you know. So you're not thinking about no. looking up, you know. Which is, um, you know, uh, it's something that you have to do is just shoot low. And I think this, uh, there was a uh, part of what, um, when Mark put his story in there, because the way in which he, he told it was uh, at that time, he was feeling quite depressed after a few, um, an incident that had happened a couple of months before in Chipinga. And um, it was one, one of his mates who always used to say, um, hey, how did it go again? Um, scintillate, scintillate, diminutive asteroid, which later he turns out, and I'll just finish the story first. And he, he always used to have this little saying, which you'd say to, uh, tell Mark. And um, Mark was feeling a bit depressed from this one little incident that was going on that had happened pr uh, prior to this. And then and he'd actually replaced Mark Torrington uh, in, the, in, the, in the initial uh, call out. Mark Torrington was, wasn't feeling good. Same thing, almost like premonition type thing. And uh, so Mark said, look, stuff it is, I'm feeling depressed anyway. I'll go, I'll take your place. And basically what happened was he stayed behind for the second. So Mark had gone in on the first wave instead of the second wave. Yeah, you get that feeling of guilt, you know, when you when somebody takes your place and you swap out and things like that. But when when Mark was actually killed, you know, he, he really felt it. And afterwards he said he actually felt this round, this, 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 this snap rocket come through and hit. And he said it just knocked him on his back when they, when they finally got the, the, the turf. And, um, and he said, when he came to, his buddy turned around to him and said, twinkle, twinkle, what, well, sorry, his expression was, he came up with this, and he said, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder how you are. And then he said, depression gone. 
it was almost like a um you actually have to read it to to understand it and, and get to understand the the feeling of um this whole thing was just terrible within you within it and how, how that this release of um guilt and uh the pain basically but the the, the saying of this guy who talked to him about was twinkle twinkle little star instead of scintillate scintillate the minute of astral but you, you have to sort of understand the guys at the time because they were they were it was a bit of a hippie uh, <laughs> and um, little incidents like that five india did have a hard time they had a lot of injuries living right on the border they being rocketed by frilima um, and having numerous exchanges with with armored cars there across the border they had a horrendous um, cross-border raid with um, uh, with the uh, uh, salute scouts nobody really thinks of national servicemen going across border they think that, that that didn't happen but it did and i guess they kept that out of the out of the papers because they didn't want anybody to know about it but uh, you know the amount of time we actually spent cross border was quite significant because you had to do, somebody had to go in somebody had to do the the groundwork somebody had to get the intelligence and and, and the groundwork because doing your ops and all the rest um that's not uh, taking away from special forces um mm. these um there's a place for everybody and um but i think one of the people that we really got to get credit to is, is the um is the pilots the air force in the one incident there at um in yangombe there was a, a lynx pilot who had actually been shot in the foot and uh he's he just sort of comes over the radio and says oh yeah he says i think i've just been shot you know <laughs> in his little style you know and he says and he looked down his foot was bleeding and everything he says oh look he says uh, doesn't seem to be too bad. <laughs> and off he went and let rip again before he went back, you know. But it was that kind of spirit that you could hear on the radio that kept you steady on the ground. And that was the sort of thing that kept your morale up. Um, these guys were, 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 you know, I'm going to take my hat off to them. You know, they were absolutely brilliant in the air in what they did. Some of them, uh, watching some of them, um, their, their skill was just phenomenal. Right at the end of, of, of my national service, when we've been um, sort of relocated from there to uh, uh, for the last three months of our national service, we were actually um, taken out of Inyanga and put in with uh, E Company uh, 4RR as a as a whole intake. Uh, two of the officers remained at uh, three in depth to um, put, when 157 came in because they didn't have enough officers. So, but uh, Dave Steadman actually took over as our OC, and um, we ended up at Mokumbura for what for most of the time they're doing some border patrol up there. But on the way, on, on our last ten days of, of coming back from, from our, if we had, I think we had about 10, 10 or so days left, and uh, we were redeployed out to uh, again our famous Ellen mission, and. Uh, I was with a uh, stick of four and we had two two black policemen with us so there were six of us and um we were dropped off very close to the uh, the ella mission school the whole the whole company was sort of put out on on op they were doing some ops and we were basically to do to make as much noise as we could and to thrash about and whatever to flush the map so that they would um so we were basically the target and we got dropped off uh, by um, internal affairs on the back of one of these um, horrible little trucks that they used to have. It's uh, Isuzu's, <laughs> no mind proofing, I think, no seats. <laughs> and uh, we, we dropped off. And as we dropped off like that, we found a couple of little pickings there. And, you, and this little pickings said, Oh, yeah, we've just been feeding them, a group of turds. So Alfie DeFreitas, he gets on the radio, the truck's gone now. But uh, Alfie gets on the radio and he tries to call in, call it in. Dead. It won't work. Doesn't matter what you did. One of the one of the oldest A60s that you can get. Our equipment was pretty old. 
because we, they had to find equipment for us because it was just we were basically right at the bottom end now our, our vehicles were just old old rls that were falling apart and uh, our rifles i mean you looked at them you thought geez are you think gonna work <laughs> but yeah. uh, uh, the, the oldest radios that you find that we just scratched pieces to, to equip us for this last 10 days sort of thing and uh, this radio wouldn't work but these two picking in said no no he said we've just been feeding them down here and he said so alfie said okay well come and show us and they led us down this little track and down like a little re-entrant and it's like a, a large hill with schools up the top and then the river line right at the bottom a little re-entrant there and all along the river line you could see that these guys have been camped there for oh God, ages these big enamel um bowls full of food and and what have you they've been there for a while and from the amount of placements we saw there there was about five or six i'd say so there was quite a significant number of them and the, 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 they sort of cut away into the into the uh, embankment so that you had like little spots where they've been sleeping but it was well used and uh, so we thought oh, bugger, we'll set up an ambush so Alfie went down and he put the claymores down in some of the areas that were, were um, more well used and larger and then we sat just above it and we sort of spread ourselves out waiting and, and placed ourselves there and as we were settling down now Alfie hadn't even managed to connect get the wires to the back creek to the, for the we were just settling down it's getting dark starting to get dark and as he was standing up they moved in a lot of them he came in and Alfie just sort of froze looking down there and then we all below us and they were talking and they were laughing like there was nothing. Now, the, the, the tour leader almost turned around and just them up the hill to the school to get food. And they must have been about 20, 30 meters away, in fact, as they walked past us up the hill, talking and laughing and carrying on like nothing was on. They couldn't see us. I don't know why they didn't see us. But uh, Mark Paul, he had the MAG, and he just sort of turned with them like that. He just sort of followed them as they were going up, just in case they turned around. And as they got to the top, the, uh, the, the two leaders standing at the bottom, he was, as he looked up, him and Alfie saw eye to eye. He didn't have his weapon with him, nor did Alfie. Alfie was standing there like the two wires in his hand, <laughs> going for the battery. And they sort of looked at each other for what? seemed like ages but it couldn't have been too long but they just froze looking at each other he he could the, the, the two he just couldn't even speak nor could alfie and alfie thought what the hell am i going to do and he dove towards the, the battery and he hit the battery suddenly there was fight and we started shooting and everything in with the grenades and then it's probably could be about six o'clock there's still a bit of light and uh we try to call in contact contact radio's not working it just won't work it just refuses and Alfie's going oh we're in trouble here we're in trouble here so and he said we couldn't do a follow-up getting too late we can't get comms we can't get anything uh, so we packed up and we we did the dogs like went about 100 meters down then pulled around and then came back back around again we stayed the night and uh all through the night, none of us slept. All through the night, we could, you know, about 12 o'clock that night, we heard this explosion. We thought, oh, what's going on here? I think one of them had killed himself with a grenade. He couldn't take it anymore. The next morning, we went in and we did a sweep. It's cold, it's wet, and it's miserable. And just there's like a little waterfall that's coming down. And there, at the, at the bottom of the riverbed there, yeah, so too, he's laying there. And he's got his AK across his chest like this. But he is not, he's been there all night, wounded. And uh, 
I don't know how he didn't die, but uh, yeah, Rosie Linda, he, he sees him and he puts his hand down to, to, to grab him out. And I'm saying, you silly slut. Pulled him back and I said, don't, he's still got his weapon. He's gonna pulled him down and helped take him hostage or sort of thing, but uh, <laughs> made him drop, him drop his, put his weapon aside and then, and then we pulled him out. He was pretty badly blown up by the, uh, the, uh, the Claymore. And, uh, but there was blood spore everywhere. There was a lot of blood spore. So there must have been an awful lot of injuries. Now, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't radio for help, couldn't do anything. We had a wounded turf and, and a dead one. So we dragged them up to the top, to the school. And we were up there. And then we tried to do a search through there. There was nobody. There wasn't a villager in sight. The food was left there. Pots were still running. You know, the fires were still burning. The food was left, everything. But there was nobody there. And uh, we sat there and we waited for three days. because We couldn't move. Eventually, Alfie had uh, he, he'd stripped down and he, um, he'd taken some of the... the because we, the next day actually we were through and this, this terrorist way in which we interrogated him, he gave up everything. He was actually a, a political commissar. We were only 10, 15 k's from the border. And uh, he said that they were due to be resupplied by about 50 to 60 terrorists come and resupply them because they'd been, um, they were running low on the ammunition and that. We down to check the arms cache. They had literally bugger all left. No mines or anything like that, but a few cases of ammunition and stuff. So we knew, yeah, they're coming over pretty soon. We've got to do something about it, but we can't hang around too much. Um, and, uh, but we couldn't move because OPs were all over. Alfie decided, no, nah, what we'll do is he took his AK, one of the AKs that we captured, and he, he dressed up like a turf and he took off on his own. And, you know, we just said to him, don't do it. You know, this is silly. This is madness because I said, you know, the OPs are out there, they'll either shoot you. So the idea was to, was to try and get um, a, the attention of the OP that, that were out there and to make sure that he, he, he went down the main road making a lot of sort of noise and stuff. And one of the OPs spotted him and they realized who it was. They called him in and the trucks came in. Then they picked up the, and thank goodness for that, because I tell you what, we were at our wits end to, uh, they're supposed to check up on you, but they said they couldn't find us or, or raise us or anything. They didn't know where we were or the problem. But eventually uh, they, they found us and they, they picked us up and took us back. But uh, this particular incident, I think was uh, my, um, it was pretty hard for me as well. Well, I think we all kind of felt it. It took a lot of um, pain. I can, I can honestly say, <coughs> would I do it again? Yes, I would. It's, it's something that you have to do. You have to be, uh, you've got to stand up and be accountable. You can't let others take over and you, know, and you just walk away from it. Um, I take my hat off to everyone who actually fought in that war because I tell you what, we were outnumbered, outgunned, outsourced, everything. I don't, I don't even know how we managed it, to be honest. But I think we have to be proud of who we are. Our children need to know these stories because it's, it's important for them to understand our heritage. You know, what we went through was probably not as bad as what some people might think, but it was bad enough. And uh, I think losing your country at the end of it, uh, it's very sad, especially to see what's, um, yeah. what's happened now. Talked about an incident that gave you PTSD to this day. Would you like that to was, tell us about that? That was the particular incident that I was talking about earlier on the, with, uh, the our final 10 days. We we're sitting there waiting for three days uh, to die, basically, because the feeling that you had was of powerlessness, you, you had no power. And to watch this, I think the most horrific thing about this was um, the one dead terrorist that we had out there, we couldn't keep him inside the school or anything like that, he was outside. And then the one night 
you know, he, he was literally eaten by the dogs, and wild dogs, and that they kept coming in. He you know, fired at them, trying to chase them away, but um, but the waiting, knowing, and unable to do anything about it, plays on you, sub, your subconscious. Because for three days we sat there, you know, it was like um, you know, almost sort of giving up hope, feeling that nobody's coming, nobody knows where we are. These guys are coming for us. What do we do? How much ammunition have we got left? How can we? How long can we hold out? You sort of think go through your mind the whole time, and then um, the final relief of being picked up. But uh, 20 years later, this very this incident, which I buried, because I, I left I left Rhodesia or, or Zimbabwe at that time in '82 to come to Australia and I'm in Perth, and uh, it was about 20 years after this incident that. Um, I was working for a company called Stanley Bostic, which was stapling and nailing and selling nail guns. And it had a faulty trigger. And uh, the, just about every five minutes, somebody would call up, you know, I'd sell about maybe 200 of these damn uh, nail guns, which had a faulty gun, a faulty trigger on them. And they weren't working. And they called me up and I was in strife. And sometimes one, two in the morning, I'd, I'd wake up in a sweat over it. And I ended up with six months not even knowing where I was or what I'd done. But it continued and, and nobody would recognize the fact that these triggers were faulty. And I, I was powerless. I, I suddenly lost control and I was feeling this anxiety that was just rising up on me. And I didn't understand what was happening because for all that time that I'd lived here in Australia, I hadn't been able to talk about my... my um, my experiences or anything like that, or how it felt, so I bottled it down. And the um, when it came to a head, I found myself out in the bush, not knowing how I got there, covered in a rash. And I had a complete and utter mental breakdown. I, I had to resign, I had to pull out, you know, I nearly, nearly lost my marriage. And there was so much, you know, I sat there. Um, in fact, my wife used to sleep. I couldn't sleep in the bed or anything like that. I was sleeping on the couch. And she would sleep just uh, on the floor but beside me. I didn't even know it. In case I'd caught up, she was worried that I was going to go and do myself in. It's just that bad it got. But then finally, I went to see a psychiatrist about it. And she said, tell me about the war. Hey, have you ever spoken about it? No. Nope. Talk to me. She got me to start talking about this incident and she said, What you have experienced is post traumatic stress. This is what you saw, what happened there. You've taken a faulty radio and mixed it with the faulty trigger. The faulty trigger has yeah. been your trigger to this incident and what you've been feeling. And I'm going, Oh my God, you're kidding me. And she said, It's pretty common. She said, What you're doing is you're reliving something over and over and over and over again, and you're not knowing where to put it, and you're not being able to speak about it. This is where I got the idea of, oh, well, I've got to talk about this. Nobody to talk about it. And then all of a sudden, started connecting with people, and they got these stories, and I thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to have to do this. And that's where I wrote the first book, and helped me speak about what I've, done, what I've been through, and to help others. And when they started speaking about it, the same sort of thing was happening for them. And when they spoke about it, the, um, uh, the last chapters in my, in, in my first book there is about the woman who, um, her wives and that, who um, experienced and went through the hell that the husbands have put them through. Yeah. A lot of us use some things that, that, that we're not really aware of. Like we, the first thing you do is you find a place and you put your back against the wall. And you start scanning. You don't know you're doing it. You get very tired doing this. Because my wife always used to say to me, you go shopping or something like that. And I get sort of halfway through, so I got to go home. She couldn't understand it. Basically, what was happening was it was sensory overload. So I'd start looking for escape routes. I start looking for this. I start looking for that. And then I start realizing. But once you understand it, you can put yourself back into, you, 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 you're able to help yourself really. You understand. Once you understand what's going on, you've got control back. Look, I, rem I remember moving one day and um, 
we had to move house and I had to move my, my internet. The first thing, <laughs> poor, poor old guy, I tell you what, because he said, it takes three days to reconnect. And I lost it. I just lost it. I started really getting upset with him and, and chewing him out. My wife said, it's three days. Think about it. Three days <laughs> waiting. Somebody mentioned three days to me, wait, I would just lose it. Not understanding it, but once you understand it now, now somebody says, uh, you know, take it, you understand it. But you have to understand it, you have to talk about it. And, you, and the worst thing about PTSD is nobody can help you until you got to the bottom and yet there's the only way left is up. The only way you can do that is start talking about it and with somebody else who understands what you've been through. And it's, so I spent a lot of time now talking to people and, mm. uh, and, and, and helping them through it. And, and mm. because it's the only way you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, when I think back, um, I went through a period of about 10 years of, self-destructive behavior i would say from the age of about 30 to the age of about into in, in, into my early 40s where um where my behavior was really self-destructive um and it happened to coincide with uh, with a, a very financially successful part of my life so i was a uh, i'd made quite a few million rand as a as a stockbroker um and I bought a fancy house in Bishop's Court and I had a Maserati and um, all the rest of it. But I actually, no, at the time, I think I was living in Lundadna. And um, I can remember many a night driving home um, way too much to drink um, in the rain in this fast car. And the one time uh, I accelerated out of a corner and lost control of the, of the Maserati and it um, smashed into a... a a barrier honestly with a with a like a 300 foot cliff drop and 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 it was just the last little section of the barrier another one meter to the side and i would have gone over that cliff um and and uh and then one day um i got a call from Tre uh, colonel trevor des fountain and um trevor said there's somebody i want you to meet um and we're gonna go crayfish diving early in the morning bring a bottle of old brown sherry with you and your wetsuit, you know? <laughs> and, and so we met on the beach at the crack of dawn. I had my bottle of old brown sherry and my wetsuit and, um, and coming out of the water with a couple of crayfish in, uh, in his hands was, uh, was Tim Bax. <laughs> and Tim had been my, Tim had been my officer in the RLI. And uh, we, yeah, we we had a bit of a reunion there, which was brought about by Trevor Desfantin, who, you know, Trevor and I had become, or oh, Trevor and I became very, very close friends. Um, and uh, of course, he was much senior. He was more senior to me, and and had taken part in the very first contact of the Rhodesian War uh, down at Chirundu when uh, Trooper Boddington was wounded in the arm, and. Um, and I, th I think uh, Colonel Dick Lockley was in charge of. Uh, or Trevor was a young second, was a young subby uh, at that time. But um, Tim Bax and uh, Uncle Jock Hutton were uh, all three of them. I think were working at Coin Security at the time. And Jock Hutton had been a Squadron Sergeant Major uh, in the SAS. And of course, Jock had jumped in the Normandy landings as a young uh, boy soldier. Yep. And so Trevor Dears Fountain, Tim Bax, Jock Hutton, and myself used to go for um, a very liquid lunch every Friday. And we were, we, uh, it gave me, first of all, to see the, th the three of them together, they were fine. And, and they'd all been through much more than I had been through, but I wasn't fine. <laughs> I was in self destruct mode, you know. And, but just seeing them being fine, um, really helped me a lot because um, we were allowed to tell stories, but we weren't allowed to, we were allowed to talk about amusing war stories, but we weren't, there was a kind of an unspoken rule that we weren't allowed to brag about, you know, I shot this guy and I shot that guy and all the rest of it. So, so sort of Audie Murphy stories were not really welcome. 
But amusing stories of, uh, you know, of, of this guy, you know, did that and this guy did that, um, we're welcome. Um, and, you know, Jock Hutton, for example, would not talk about his World War II experiences uh, to anyone other than a fellow soldier. And then he would only open up uh, if he'd had too much to drink. And if he really liked you, you know, then he would then he would be prepared to talk about it, you know. Otherwise, he would, you know, wear his Sergeant Major hat and clam up and uh, you know crap on you for something. Um, so, you know, Jock told me so many of his World War II experiences about how, how I mean, a lot of people don't know Jock was captured by the Germans and yep. and and nearly shot with a firing squad and was rescued by some German paratroopers and managed to escape. But I mean, um, Somehow, these regular lunches with the fellow soldiers, all of whom were outranked me, all of whom were much more experienced and senior to me, made me realize that um, I just started, I came right. I just, I just somehow, something changed in my mind where I thought, there's no reason for you to feel sorry for yourself. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Take control of your life and come right. And um, yeah, I think talking, talking, even if it's to your fellow buddies um, at the monthly prayer meeting or something, you know, fellowship with with other Rhodesians and fellowship with others who understand and who've been through the same things that you've been through is, I think, vitally important in recovering from PTSD. It's when you're alone and isolated and bottle stuff up, and then you then you mull that stuff over in the early hours of the of the morning when you can't sleep, and that leads to things like uh, suicide and that type of thing, and which is completely unnecessary. Actually, I mean, life is precious, and we need to live every day to the full you know and i think that i think it's a good thing these interviews that we have because in a way they sort of cathartic because you're getting it out there you're putting it on the record and it's you're unburdening yourself of all those memories you know and 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 the people who are watching the videos really appreciate that they appreciate these memories are precious to you and sometimes bought with blood you know um they're not cheap memories they're not uh light-hearted mm -hmm. memories some of them are light-hearted but but a lot of the time, you know, what you're talking about is, and the thing is, we we were just teenagers. Well, I was anyway. I don't know about you, You're early twenties. I was a teenager, so it's you're at a very impressionable age where you kind of like blotting paper and you absorb everything in this like larger than life, three D Technicolor adventure. You know, um, um, okay, it did help <laughs> that that I thought that I was invincible, that it was always going to happen to someone else and not to me. Uh, yep. And I think maybe that comes with being a teenager, you know. Uh, oh, now that I'm older, I realize I, I realize how vulnerable I am. But in those days, I was completely bulletproof, you know. Uh, but oh, but oh. still impressionable, you know. And um, and yeah, I absorbed yeah. all those things. Yep. I think it's also important for the uh, the wives and the girlfriends and the, the, the your your children and your grandchildren to understand you, because that's where they, uh, I think, understanding. And saying so, they're suddenly realizing, oh, so that's why he's done that. So that's why he does that. Like my wife now, when you go shopping or anything, and I, and I said, oh, I've had enough. There's no argument anymore, conflict any, any longer. And we can understand each other with it. So it, it's about understanding those, those boundaries and realizing when, when one's had enough. Because sometimes it can get too much, especially when there's too many crowds or something like that. Mm. You get a sensory overload. And you, once you realize what, what, what's happening, you want to walk you got to get away from it but yeah. to do it in the best possible way is to retreat from that is to just like have your little safe word and say you know time to go and then not have a conflict over it i've got to finish this off i've got to do this i've got to do that it's no longer a battle anymore it's one of the and i think a lot of the women went through a lot yeah you know on that subject david um not knowing i, th I think we haven't covered um enough at all actually the the role that the woman played the farmer's wives who had to stay alone on the farm maybe with a bright light an old uh, dad's army guy to look after them but maybe not i don't know you know and having to go and check on the cattle or whatever i mean imagine the terror and fear of being a farmer's wife a widow her husband's away on call up and she's all alone on the farm with the kids waiting for her husband to come back and we need to cover those stories as well it's very much you know you might say well it's inappropriate for fighting men of Rhodesia but I think that this this series is not just about the war heroes you know we started off with the war heroes the guys who won the bronze crosses and the 
and the uh, silver crosses and everything. But um, there's, you know, there's a lot of other stories, I think, in this whole saga that do need to be told. And I'd like to encourage Rhodesian women to come forward and tell the stories of what happened with them and having a husband who's away on call up. And also, um, you know, the, the, the problems that they had to deal with, with, with a husband suffering from PTSD and how they coped with it, you know, and how they helped him. I mean, I was really touched by that story of how your, your wifey came and slept on the floor. She, she's, look, she comes from very, very strong stock as well. Now, a lot of people don't realize that she's, um, uh, she was breech born, so she meant she was born. And uh, even today now, her, her right arm, you know, only has limited um, um, use. But, you know, to see her work, you, you wouldn't even know it. <laughs> the way she swings up and does the washing, she, she does all sorts of, you know, you, that you wouldn't think that she was paralyzed there. But um, her, her mother, now, her dad was a, a sergeant major in uh, Tuara and uh, later with RDR, and he actually committed suicide, sadly. And she was only 16 at that time, but uh, her mother was uh, with the Women's Voluntary Service. She was a commandant in Bulawayo there. And uh, when he uh, disappeared for several days, they couldn't find him. The police were looking for him and that. And she actually got a letter from a terrorist saying, we know who you are. We know what you're doing. We know where you, who your kids are. We know where they go to school. She had to live with that. Can you imagine that? Uh, uh, people don't know this. There's this letter from this from terrorist saying, you know, we know who you are. We don't like what you're doing. Because with the women's voluntary service, I mean, they did a huge amount of work for behind the scenes and that. And um, to have that sort of thrown at you, especially when your husband's just dis and um, taken, but he hadn't. Yeah. So it, pretty tragic. So like I said, there's a lot of these stories out there that uh, they need to be told. Yeah. yeah. Because, I, again, I can't even imagine uh, um, the... Uh, what they put up with mm. it was a lot it was very isolated yeah yeah for sure you know, my, my girlfriend that i had while i was uh, in the army um uh her name was sharon ridley uh we met in, in the church and um <coughs> excuse me both her parents were uh, murdered by terrorists um they were farming in the centenary area um and um i think um, i i'm not sure i think their farm was called oban but uh but they had been out grocery shopping her parents and um and when they came back uh, he stopped the bucky to open the gate and uh, when he did that the terrorists ambushed them and uh killed him and his wife um, so now Sharon and her brother Charles Ridley were orphaned and uh, were adopted by their next door neighbor, the people on the next farm, who was uh, the Fletchers. And they had a, um, a son, Gavin Fletcher, who also joined the RLI. So I think Charles Ridley and Gavin Fletcher are names that come up quite a lot. Uh, both, I think, ended up in the RLI. Um, and both were just little lighties when I was in the RLI and they used to look at me in my greens and my beret and, <laughs> and everything. But yeah, I can remember going to the <laughs> house and and uh, they let me stay there. Um, and and that's where, you know, that Sharon was there and uh, she was my girlfriend while I was, while I was in the RLI. Um, and yeah, so these kind of stories, you know, um, uh, are tragic, but need to be told, I think. We saw the sharp end of it, but they saw the other side of it. It was uh, yeah. not, not an easy one. Perhaps harder than the sharp end, because the sharp end, you're always busy. Uh, you're always uh, occupied, but it's, you know, the thing that is more difficult is the loneliness and the waiting and the anticipation of something happening. You know, that's way more difficult than being in the sharp end and being busy all the time with your mates. It's way more scary. Yeah. Dave, thank you so much for your time, my brother. Um, uh, your talk has, uh, has uh, I found it uh, very moving and interesting, and you've stimulated a lot of uh, thoughts in my mind. And I don't think that the story of 147 is over yet by a long shot. Uh, I noticed while you were talking that um, um, 
Paul Allen sent me uh, a bunch more photographs. So I'll, yeah. I'll be able to use those in the beginning of this, uh, in the introduction of this video. Uh, so, so Paul's uh, uh, yes, also been working and doing a lot of waiting. background support work, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated, my brother. So until next time, because um, I'm sure you have more stories, I'm, I'm always available to interview you. Um, I will, yeah, edit this and uh, let's talk again. Well, I'm very grateful for the opportunity actually to to tell the stories because the, the, these stories need to be kept in um, uh, as part of our heritage. So, yeah, I've really enjoyed doing it, and I'd like to thank you for the for the opportunity. So. That's a pleasure. Great. Okay, my brother. Thank you. Thanks a lot.